and Charles. I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Linda Quinlan, and welcome to all things LGBTQ. This is what is? Oh yeah, this is May nineteenth. We're taping today in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. So, and yes, I have some headlines, and I'm ready with them. They are as follows. News from Taiwan, largely good news. Uh, the president celebrates Taiwan same-sex marriage legislation anniversary. LGBT groups launch petition to allow cross-national same-sex marriage. And I have a picture now of the petitioners who are demonstrating to expand the rights that Taiwan already has granted its citizens. Um, Finally, about Taiwan, the LGBTQ survey that was conducted shows that improved interpersonal relationships exist at work for Taiwanese LGBTQ people. That's very good news. Um, other news, uh, the court orders the release of jailed LGBT Ugandans after coronavirus charges dropped. And this is the end of a long story or maybe part of an ongoing story. I'll show you a clip of that. There are 23 men and women cowering on the forecourt of a shelter in Uganda. They're young and homeless and some are sick. Where were to know no? Stupid. Where were? But they are treated with brutality by the authorities because, say human rights groups, they're gay. These pictures, obtained by Sky News, show the mayor of a municipality near the capital, Kampala, beating shelter residents with a four-foot cane. And he and his officials taunt and interrogate those trembling before them. We've obscured the identity of the shelter's occupants, something the authorities have been determined to reveal. However, the official explanation for this raid doesn't mention homosexuality. Instead, the shelter manager and residents are accused of spreading the coronavirus. And the police bind their hands and tie them together with rope and force march them to the municipal police station. Nineteen people from the shelter were charged by police and imprisoned. And they've been cut off from the outside world. Lawyers haven't been permitted a single visit in the past five weeks. Patricia Kamira will lead their defense. Like I said, it was a trumped up charge, doing an act that is likely to spread infection of disease. These are people who were found in a shelter, in a home, a, pl a place that they take as home. For me, I still believe that there was no violation at all of any of the rules. Uganda's longtime leader, Uweri Museveni, casts himself as a man's man, doing press-ups in the presidential office during the country's lockdown. And he's got no time for sexual equality. Same-sex relationships are strictly illegal. Still, the United Nations Special Rapporteur told me Museveni's administration should release the 19 defendants. I think it would be important that there is an immediate consideration of the release of these persons and uh, certainly uh, the ac their access to lawyers. In response, Kampala's police spokesman told us the incident wasn't a raid, it was a community initiative targeting improper social distancing. The mayor declined to give us a comment. Lawyers for the defendants continue to seek their release. John Sparks, Sky News. Anti-LGBT violence and discrimination remain high, an EU report says. 
LGBTQ people have become the new scapegoats for the coronavirus. That's another story. A man arrested in the notorious 1980s killing of a gay American in Australia. And I have some pictures to show you now. The first is of the victim um, who was thrown off a cliff in 1988 as part of a string of anti-gay murders. His, uh, his name was Steve Johnson. No, his name was Scott Johnson. And his brother, so I have a picture of Scott Johnson. And I now have a, pic of a picture of his brother, Steve Johnson, who uh, is sitting in the location where his brother was, was shoved off the cliff. He's pursued this case for years. The crime occurred in 1988. Um, the police said it was a suicide. He didn't believe it for a minute. Um, so several, several appeals occurred and finally the police in New South Wales have reviewed the deaths not only of um, Scott Johnson but of 88 other men between 1976 and 2000 uh, and the police found that 20 were linked to anti-gay bias. So finally someone has been charged in this murder of Scott Johnson. And that is 49-year-old uh, Scott Witt. The, re the police didn't release the name, but journalists found out about it. So there's that story. Um, to continue, one-third of trans Colombians have undergone conversion therapy, a survey finds. Uh, in better news, Albanian psychologists have banned so-called conversion therapy. Germany passes legislation banning conversion therapy for minors. Brazil's Supreme Court throws out the rules that limit gay men from donating blood. Lifelong blood donation ban for gay and bisexual men in Hungary is lifted. Same-sex marriage will be legal in Costa Rica on May 26th, and to conclude my headlines, Delhi High Court dismisses plea seeking financial aid to sex workers in the LGBT community during lockdown. Iraqi politicians call for expulsions after the raising of the rainbow flag on certain embassies. Uh, in honor of the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Transphobia, and so forth. Uh, finally, the troublemaker in Morocco, who uh, was the Instagram influencer, has apologized for all the trouble she calls there. And remember, I told you about it last time. She outed the gay men in Morocco and you know, it was a very misguided effort to raise awareness. So those are my headlines. Let's move on now to Keith. All right. So following up on some of the things that Anne had to say for international headlines, as a connection with some things happening here, FDA, they might have gotten a letter from 17 state attorney generals saying that it was time to lift the ban on men who have sex with men donating blood and plasma. Now, the FDA had recently changed their regs so that if you were a man who had sex with men and were celibate for three months, you were an acceptable donor. What the state's attorney generals have said is that Men who have sex with men should be held to the same criteria as everyone else. Of note, yes, indeed, Vermont's Attorney General T.J. Donovan is one of the people who signed on to this letter. T.J. did it without having to be prompted by the LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont 
or Vermont's community organizations. He did this entirely on his own because he knew it was the right thing to do. Related story, Canada has finally decided that they are going to build the memorial to the fruit machine. And that's truly the language they were using, which is the equivalent of Vermont's lavender scare during the McCarthy era, where LGBTQ plus people were banned from serving in the military or in government positions. The reason it was called the fruit machine in Canada is they used this process where they would attach blood pressure cuffs, lie detectors, and then show people erotica and would measure your blood pressure. And if you started perspiring, and if your pupils dilated in relationship to seeing same sex erotica. How this equates to conversion therapy is that this was actually an early form of conversion therapy where they not only monitored your response, but you were attached to electrodes. So you got an electric shock if you were responding and it was supposed to diminish those impulses. And then we're gonna talk some about the legislature. The legislature is back in full force. They are meeting remotely. I spent most of today watching legislative hearings. They have decided that they have done all of the necessary COVID-19 emergency pieces of legislation. So now they're going back and looking at, okay, what were the priorities at the beginning of the session? And can we start taking those bills up again? And some of the things they're looking at is Act 250 reform, and in particular, the Older Vermonters Act, which I will talk about more in detail. What they've also decided is they're going to stay in session via the remote access until June. Then they're going to break June to the beginning of August, which is primary season. And there is a primary. You should be getting a card for mail-in ballots. Then they're coming back after the primary to finish their work. Part of that is they're only going to do the first three months of the next fiscal year, then come back and look at what is the economic status before they move on for more conclusive. So with that, we're gonna turn it over to Linda. Well, thank you. My first story is about Ian, North Ian Northrup, who is a friend of ours in New York City and also a post, co-host of Gay USA. She was part of a protest in which uh, they use social distancing, the police, to um, justify a crackdown and break up an LGB demonstration to stop Franklin Graham from continuing to have his hospital Samaritan purse in Central Park. Anne, 72, has been isolating since the coronavirus started, but she felt she had to come out for this event. Um, and and protest to make it clear that allowing religious organizations that oppress LGBTQ people would not be tolerated. As we talked about last week, Graham's organization would not let LGBTQ people volunteer, um, and everyone who worked there had to sign a statement of faith. Everyone wore a mask, and was socially distancing, but the police still broke up the demonstration and gave Miss Northrup a summons to appear in court. We also learned that Reverend Billy, who was reported on last week, also received a summons. And I have a picture of both of them together, um, a picture. So we'll move on from that. Um, the new, new New, the U.S. Navy has granted a waiver allowing a transgender service member to serve in their preferred gender. This is the first waiver approved since Trump's um, military ban went into effect. The name of the sailor was not available. And my friend Gail suggested a show called Turdy Work, uh, which is on True TV. So I have a little clip, and thank you, Gail. Why couldn't this happen 30 years ago? I'm all dried up and all my cracks and crevices, I got chunks falling off me, I got friggin' kittens growing off my friggin' top lip. 
That ain't right. We've got a town office. We've got a fire station in a town of 500 with only four paved roads. That's pretty significant. I'm Dale. Uh, I've been working with Mary for a little while now. <laughs> I just love him to death. He comes up with the darndest ideas. My name is Tammy. They call me the bitch on the hill, because I am. The concept for Turdy Works is simple. I find turds, I make crap, and people buy it. <laughs> Instead of a popsicle, that's a poopsicle that tastes like crap. Since then, it's grown into like 50, 60 different products. We got dingleberries with hairy balls. <laughs> the best sellers are the poo poo blocks. A lot of people have great ideas and launch big companies. Mine just happens to be I have a wonderful wife I've been with for 14 years. She basically stole my heart. <laughs> and then we fostered three little kids. You guys are stuck with us. <laughs> my parents play with poop. This is really embarrassing. It's been 10 years. We're still struggling. I'm just sick of always being broke. I mean, we've got a lot of stuff to fix, and we're still playing with turds. What are you going to do? Let's just give it to the rest of the winter. I'm going to need all of you guys' help. I believe in Turdy Works, and I believe in this community. You know, anyone before that thought my stank, they can think again. You name it, I'll get it for you. I didn't like Mary. I wouldn't put up with her This is my one shot to save Turdy Works. That's awesome. If she can pull it off, it'll be awesome. I never would have imagined anything could have come from just one turd. It's like a girl's dream come true. Hey, Tam, I got you a box of alpaca turds. You've lost it. They squeeze right out of the butt, you know, like one of those little things. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, no, I stuck my finger in my mouth and <laughs> on it. <laughs>
they're due in court in August, so we'll see if they can even get to court at that point. And they have some good lawyers, so hopefully it'll be good. And may I add about the Carla J article, it describes the first lesbian dance in the village. It's really a hoot. We heard it delivered in June in New York. So I second Linda's recommendation of that. Um, but now I have my depressing stories and they uh, let's focus for a little on LGBTQ people becoming the new scapegoats for the coronavirus. Uh, let's go if we could to Seoul, South Korea where um, the outing of LGBTQ people has begun. Last weekend, four months into the pandemic, news outlets started publishing the identities of gay men who've tested positive for the virus. You may recall South Korea was widely praised for its action on the coronavirus, but then um, and in April, it reported zero cases, but a second outbreak has occurred. Um, and this, the response to this outbreak was quickly diverted onto gay men when a Christian newspaper reported that the few dozen cases associated with nightclubs in the Itaewon, which is the gay area of Seoul, or gay venues, and I have a picture now before you of a gay club in that area. Not all of those diagnosed were gay and not all of the nightclubs linked to new cases were gay venues, but a slew of other news organizations started publishing the names, addresses, and workplaces of gay people who had tested positive. Further revelations that two of the men had been to a gay sauna followed, unleashing a wave of hostility. The incident echoes the anti-gay backlash that permeated the AIDS crisis and marks the latest in an emerging global trend during the COVID-19 epidemic, the scapegoating of LGBTQ people. Should I go on to Hungary or go on to Keith? I'll go on to Keith. Um, you have the floor now. I've ended my stories for the moment. Uh, and, and we thank you. My great pleasure. <laughs> so talking a little bit about the Vermont legislature, both the Senate and the House have voted to allow remote access, remote voting. They're going back and working over, looking at their priorities established at the beginning of the year. Now, one of the pieces of legislation that has been of interest is H611, which was under discussion by House Human Services when COVID-19 essentially shut down the legislature. H611 is the Older Vermonters Act. And what it's, it looks at doing is going in and ensuring that social economic needs of Vermont's aging community are met and that Vermont's aging community is included in all of those statewide plans. One of the conversations that was happening today is that COVID-19 showed how the seniors community had been left out of a lot of the emergency planning protocols that have been put in place. One of the areas that was specifically discussed were adult daycares, where there are actually, there is actually an adult daycare in the central Vermont area that has indicated that they will not be reopening because this is taking such a financial toll on them that they no longer have the resources. So part of the community committee discussion was how do we put in place mechanisms to ensure that that type of financial support is given to those essential organ those essential services so that when you get through the emergency those services are still in place now if you are interested in any piece of legislation if you go on the legislative site you can very easily just click live stream and actually see the committee hearing as it's happening, much as the same as you're watching this show. The other piece that I'm really gonna be looking for, and there's actually two, 
One is the constitutional amendment for which is the equality of rights. And what this does is it takes all of the protected classes that we've been putting into statute over the years and elevates them to the constitutional level. So that if there is another hostile federal regime, we know that our protections in Vermont are secure. The other thing we're gonna be looking for is if the legislature does pass a bill that would give the Secretary of State the authority to authorize mail-in ballots for the upcoming election. And the conflict between the Scott administration and the current Secretary of State, the Scott administration says they're kind of uncertain about how this would work they need more information before they would be comfortable making a decision that yes, this is what we're gonna do. What the Secretary of State's office has tried to say is the decision about if we are or are not going to do that is a secondary conversation. The first conversation is if we were to do this, how would we do this? And do we have all of the supportive protocols in place that we then could do it. And what the Secretary of State's office was saying was, was that the notification going out to the town clerks, the printing of ballots, you know, just the protocols of how to do it need to be put in place now so that we can then make the decision of, okay, is this what we want to do? So with that said, I'm going to turn it back over to Linda. Well, hi again, and thanks, Keith. That was informative information. Um, I would like to talk about bisexual author Samantha Irby, who breathes life into all her intersections. She is a New York Times bestseller writer who recently released her book called Wow, No Thank You, and is the one of the Advocates Women of the Year. Her blog is called bitches gotta eat. She writes about her intersectionality that is never dogmatic or academic. As she says, she's black, fat, bi, has Crohn's disease, and gets to the heart of our daily interactions with life's most irritating people. And here's a picture of her. Um, and um, did anybody watch The Fosters? It was a show that was on um, uh, TV about a, a lesbian couple who are raising uh, foster children. Um, anyway, there's been a spinoff from that show, um, and it's being streamed live on Hulu, and it's called Good Trouble, starring Z Zuri Adele, Sherry Cola, Emma Hutton, and Haley Sehar, and um, it's heading for the third season. I, I would going to start watching if I can. And it features an Asian American lesbian and a bisexual Latinx man. So that should be really interesting. I like the Fosters. It was a little hokey, but I, I kind of liked it. Um, and Beckett Cipher, son of Melissa Etheridge, and Jane Cipher dies at 21 to, of opiate addiction. David Crosby is the father of both her children. Um, and sadly, a transgender woman was brutally murdered in San Diego barbershop, a uh, San Antonio barbershop. Hello, Jay O'Regan was 20 and was getting ready to open up the store. The shop was locked, but was open to a man that said he would like to ha make an appointment. He left for a minute and then returned back into the shop with a gun and a knife. He forced the workers into the back of the shop. Video shows him choking O'Regan. The other two women, the other two workers managed to escape. He then stabbed Orion to death. Damien Campbell, 42, has been arrested after he gave his real name when he made an appointment. Can you believe it? David Carter, best known for Stonewall Historian, as a Stonewall Historian, has died. He was 67. San Francisco History Museum plans 
are shelved amid the virus pandemic. The San Francisco nonprofit is instead pivoting its efforts to creating a virtual museum and archival center using the vast holdings they've collected over the last three and a half decades. And uh, a shout out to Little Richard, uh, rock and roll pioneer, dies at 87. He was born in Macon, Georgia, and has been in poor health for the last few years. His breakthrough single was Tutti Frutti, and um, it was originally about anal sex. But his manager, however, wouldn't publish the song unless he cleaned it up. He was conflicted about his homosexuality, but at the end, he seems to have come to terms with the fact that he was gay. And my last story here is about the Washington Blade Political reporter Chris Johnson last week challenged White House Press Secretary Kaylee McEnany over her opposition to marriage equality and the administration's preparedness for the upcoming Supreme Court decision on whether Title VII applies to sexual orientation and gender identity. These were legitimate questions, especially given the gravity of the upcoming High Court ruling which could bar employment discrimination against LGBT workers in all 50 states. He found himself after this, though, um, to uh, being trashed on uh, Twitter and other uh, social media as he, they called him Chrissy, Light and the Loafers, and the Gestapo Clown, the Gay Gestapo Clown. Um, and um, he, you know, was also trashed on, uh, by the Rush Limbar and, and that gang at Fox News. So anyway, that's it for me. So I will pass my torch to Anne, I guess, isn't it? No, okay, well, you're going to introduce an interview. I was about to do it. Since I was Are we doing on. that now? Okay. I would like to introduce, Pete's in a, a fabulous interview with De Deb Ingram, who is Chittenden County Senator, running for Lieutenant Governor. So let's look at that. I want to welcome you all to our first All Things Zoom interview. And I couldn't be happier that it's an old friend and actually one of our most frequent guests. Please welcome back Chittenden County Senator Debbie Ingram. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Now, we have a lot to talk about because life as we knew it in January has changed in many ways. One, by virtue of how the Senate is operating and the bills you're looking at and also something that you might be doing for the next step in your political career. So let's talk first about the Senate and how are you all doing with this new reality? It is a new world, for sure. Well, we are doing this same thing that you and I are doing now. We're doing a lot of Zoom uh, remote meetings and um actually i'm on uh, the health and welfare committee and so we immediately jumped in to pass some emergency legislation to make sure that our healthcare system was working well for vermonters as we began dealing with the pandemic so uh, i have been um on committee meetings well three to four days a week uh, which we would have done anyway if we met in person um, in health and welfare. And then we've had all Senate um, meetings together. And then we finally made the transition to actually being able to have um, quote unquote floor sessions uh, by Zoom. Um, so we've been doing business and, and actually passing legislation. So now, it's quite a steep curve. Yeah, I was gonna, now, do any of you actually come into the building anymore? We did at the very beginning, we had, uh, we've had two sessions since this all began. 
uh, with only 16 of us, because that's a that's a quorum in the Senate, and uh, had to pass. We had to pass some legislation before we um, gave ourselves permission to do things remotely. So we we've done that twice, and we we so we were socially distant, and we you know wore our masks and our gloves, and you know we 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 followed the guidelines. But now we can do everything remotely. Now, and this has worked out well, and if I, as a constituent, have an interest in a particular piece of legislation, is there a way that I can track it in committee and see what it is that the committee is taking for action or testify if I wanted to? Yes, yes. So our web, the legislative website is still functioning well and updated all the time. And so you can see our agendas when a piece of legislation is coming up. And then when we're actually in session um, meeting, we have our um, Zoom sessions are, bro are broadcast on YouTube. So you can follow along on YouTube. But if you wanted to testify, then you'd have to contact the chair and the committee assistant beforehand and be invited into the Zoom platform. We are trying to avoid having Zoom bombing, which has unfortunately happened. <laughs> uh, so that's why we, we put it on YouTube for people to watch. Now, you had mentioned that health and welfare had passed and, and very quickly some COVID specific pieces of legislation. In other states, there's been some conflict between the legislature and the administration about how the administration had approached COVID. How do you all feel about what our administration has been doing and their approach? I think on for the most part, we're, we've all been very pleased with how the administration has handled things. And we, um, um, we especially appreciate the caution and the ability to listen to our scientists and our doctors to make decisions, which is something, of course, we don't see at the <laughs> national level necessarily, so we're happy to see that. I think the biggest concern we have, though, is um, the um, lack of preparation for the huge number of claims for unemployment insurance and how uh, that has really been uh, a kind of a mess, uh, to use a technical term, um, <laughs> when people have been calling in and trying to make claims and then when um, they've had issues or problems with their claim trying to get back into the system to get somebody to correct it. And, th and that has truly been a, a terrible hardship on many Vermonters because they've had to go for weeks with their claim not being processed properly and then uh, not getting any, not having any income. And so really um, we've, we've unfortunately heard from some very desperate folks. So that, that's been the worst part of the response so far. Now, is it possible that the legislature is going to step in and take action, or are you somewhat confident with how the administration has tried to turn that around? Well, that is really a function of the Department of Labor. So um, what the legislature has been able to do is put pressure on them. We've, you know, we've had the uh, commissioner come in and speak uh, to us in various settings several times. Um, we have uh, individually um, uh, emailed and called different employees in the Department of Labor. Um, the House members actually did take it upon themselves to be able to enter the portal that the Department of Labor runs to actually check on individual cases of constituents. Um, so they've done some of that. So, so we've tried to do as much as we possibly can, although it is, I mean, it is essentially an administrate, administrative function. Now, building off what you had said about, you know, we had Vermonters who were waiting for a paycheck and waiting for the additional monies that had been promised to come in. I noticed that the legislator, legislature had taken action to try and put in place moratoriums on evictions and foreclosures. You know, are, are we likely to see more of those types of actions? I think that we've done, um, we've laid a good foundation. We, we did pass um, uh, that legislation. Um, we've 
we reached out to financial institutions and to landlords uh, also and have um, encouraged individuals to, to do that because we, we have been told that there are a lot of um, um, institutions that are, that are um, willing to work with their uh, people who borrowed from them um, to, to work out a different payment schedule. So, um, you know, we've taken quite a bit of action uh, in, a, in a lot of different areas. And I think at this point, we feel like we've, uh, we've covered most of the essential uh, things um, right now. So we're actually beginning to move towards some of the legislation that we had passed out of committee before the crisis began. And we're uh, just yesterday, we started expanding to look at some of the bills that we were trying to pass before this all started. Which, which is a wonderful segue into the other than COVID, you all had, and you personally had some priorities of actions that you wanted to see during this second year of the biennium. What are those pieces of legislation that you're really hopeful are still gonna see some action? And is there a sense of how long the session might now last? because I had seen some of the public media reporting that with the remote accessing and you know all of the changes that were needed to take in place, that you all might still be meeting remotely into the fall. That's right. Well, some of the um, legislation that I'm particularly interested in um, is some of the climate change um, bills. Uh, um, I've, I've been on the climate caucus and um, climate solutions caucus um, and especially the global warming solutions act uh, the house passed that so it's coming over to the senate we also in the senate we passed a bill called the justice reinvestment to um, act and that would help to reduce the population in our prisons and improve programming uh, for inmates so that when they get out they are more likely to succeed um, so we're, we are hoping the House will take that up. Um, there are a variety of, since I'm on education and, and health and welfare, there are a variety of uh, different uh, bills that we've been working on um, in education, uh, delaying our change, changes in special education so that we're better prepared for them, um, and also restructuring how the teacher healthcare bargaining um, happens. So some of the you know, some of those things are still important to us, um, but yes, the, in terms of the schedule, um, what we're being told now is that hopefully uh, we'll be able to do the budget adjustments for this year, and then we'll pass a uh, a limited budget for just the first quarter of FY21. Hopefully, we're going to get that done by mid June. Then we'll stop from mid-June through the primary, through about mid-August. And then we'll go back to uh, have a better sense of how much federal money we'll, we'll be getting, what our revenue looks like, so that we can do a budget for the rest of fiscal year 21. So that's what we're looking at now. Okay, so a couple things that you touched on quickly. I mean, first, climate change. I mean, certainly with the stay-at-home orders, we've seen some of the dramatic benefits from reducing carbon footprints. But let's talk about education and funding and maybe Vermont colleges. Ah, yes. <laughs> Since you're on the education committee and all of a sudden it became more of a priority than when you thought at the beginning of the session what are you all thinking and, and how might you all be approaching that? Well, we, we do have a financial crisis in our, in our colleges. We, we were working on um, trying to provide two years of free tuition to Vermonters for community college that we, we had a bill that we were working on when the crisis struck. Mm -hmm. um, 
because we've heard for many years now that, and it, and it is absolutely true that the uh, state underfunds our colleges. I, I think we're actually 49th in among the 50 states and how much money we invest in our higher education, which, which is dismal, obviously. Um, but we had, <laughs> we, we were, we were taken by surprise uh, with the chancellor's um, kind of nuclear option of actually shutting down some of the um, campuses. And um, that, of course, catalyzed everybody into action, though, because, I, you know, the, these, these colleges are, they're important, of course, for the students, they're important uh, employers for teachers and other staff, and they're really cultural centers in the communities in which they're located. So this would have a devastating effect, um, you know, all across the state. So, so now um, that, that that proposal has been um, <clears throat> pulled off the table, we're working to use some of the federal funds that we're getting in to, um, to do some transitional funding for a period of time so that we can uh, call in um, a consultant to help analyze the situation and work with the trustees um, and come up with a long-term solution that will uh, make sure that we can keep those colleges open. So might education and free tuition be part of someone's platform who might just happen to be running for lieutenant governor? <laughs> Well, that might be true. That might be true. Well, you know, I um, I am running for lieutenant governor. Thank you for that for that segue. Um, and yet, yeah, truly, I think that this crisis has helped us to shine a bright light on the gaps that we have already in our in our systems. We're we're just seeing um, we're seeing the problem with. Um, education. Um, we're, we're seeing the problems with broadband. We're seeing that if, if Vermonters had been making um, higher wages, they would have had some savings to draw on so that two weeks of not getting paid wouldn't be devastating for them. Uh, we're seeing that if we had paid family leave, that we, that could help tide people over. We're seeing all sorts of problems with our systems. And one of the reasons that um, I'm running for lieutenant governor is to, is to say, um, well, let's yes, this is a crisis, but let's also view it as an opportunity because we obviously too were able to um, address some of these problems literally overnight. You know, our, our homeless population, we were able to, to house and, you know, the Burlington mayor put mo motor homes on North Beach. Uh, you know, we put um, folks in motels. It's because we decided as a group and we had the leadership to, to know that this, this is urgent and we have to do something about it now. If we brought that courage and that political will to all of our various problems, including college tuition and, and all kinds of other things, um, then I think we would really see some big changes in our society. And that's the kind of vision and the kind of forward thinking that I want to bring to the Office of Lieutenant Governor. And from reading your statement on your campaign page, you are someone who has confronted challenges and showed incredible strength and resilience. So what I would ask you is, why this move now? Why, why is this the time Deb Ingram should be Vermont's Lieutenant Governor? Well, the um, originally the reason I, I I've been thinking about it for a while, but, but just for a practical reason, um, when uh, David Zuckerman, did, the current lieutenant governor, decided to run for governor, it, it created an opening. And and practically speaking, in Vermont, you have to seize those opportunities when um, when they when they come because they they don't come around that often. But um, but I do think that the timing has has been really um, really special because um, yes from you know from my um, uh, my early days my my dad died when I was sixteen um, to um, my early career when I was uh, discriminated against and fired from work because of my sexual orientation um, to living overseas in a in a a developing country in Bangladesh and having to deal with the challenges of, of 
uh, that um, existence, um, you know, to um, my um, recovery from alcoholism, uh, all of these kinds of things are, um, um, you know, they make you a seasoned person. And, um, and I think that you, there's no substitute for life experience. And I, I really believe that I'm a candidate that can be compassionate to all of us as we're uh, facing the, the grief and the loss of what we've had to go through in the crisis and also be hopeful and optimistic and help uh, lead people forward to a, a stronger tomorrow. And I've always been impressed by your honesty and integrity and your willingness to respond directly to a situation. So as we are rapidly running out of time, people who want to become involved in your campaign, we will put the contact email address on the screen. You have a series of virtual tours that you are doing? That's right, yes. There are 14 counties in Vermont and we're going to each one uh, virtually. Uh, hopefully at some point, maybe in person, but we're going to each one in turn. So um, uh, each week we're releasing a new video. Uh, next week we'll be releasing the one on Washington County. And I'll be interviewing people who are doing exciting things, either businesses or nonprofits um, in Washington County, uh, talking a little bit about things that are fun to do once we can get out again. And um, also looking at the historical contributions that the county has made. So uh, they'll be on my YouTube channel. You can go to my website, ingramvt.com to get the link. And um, yes, email me if you wanna be on my email list. And the primary is August 11. That's right. And I, before we started taping, you said that people would probably be receiving postcards encouraging people to do a mail-in ballot that needs to be received by your town clerk on or before August 11. And you were endorsed by LPAC. Yes, I was. That's right. I'm very excited. Yeah, I'm very pleased. And, and that wasn't a merely here I am and I fit your profile. You needed to be interviewed by them and they needed to say, yes, what you stand for is something we would support. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yes. And I would be the first openly lesbian statewide office holder in Vermont. So. And it would give me more than ample opportunity to come back and say, old friend, it, it's time for us to talk again. I would <laughs> enjoy that very much. <laughs> so with that, thank you very much for being our first Zoom interview and good luck with your campaign. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great to be here. Great interview, Keith. Yeah. Very informative. Of note, this month on Deb Ingram's virtual tour of Vermont, it's Washington County. I watched it. Very Did, okay. informative. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that, Linda. I say, even during these hard times, we do what we can and remember to resist. Yes.